we all have that moment in our lives where suddenly the light goes off. You kind of realize who you want to be, what you want to be about, the kind of person you want to grow up to be. Mine was in 1968. I was nine and getting ready to turn 10. And it was a great time, man. I was into skateboarding, and it was a great time to be here in Southern California. And light brought up a point that I think is very pointed because my eyes, like many people's eyes, were kind of pulled open um, when Dr. King was assassinated in April. But there was hope. And for my, for my kind of nine-year-old sense of, of, of excitement about the world I was about to wander into, the hope was encapsulated by Bobby Kennedy. Now, Bobby Kennedy was coming to California to run um, for the president of the United States. This was a big deal, man. This was, he had come in late, but I really want you to take in this picture, man, because Bobby Kennedy hit this town. Man, he, look, he's almost surfing that crowd. Man, and he would be pulled out of these appearances he made all over Southern California and all over the state, literally with this, with this, with this like, God, you know, everything frayed, shoes missing. Man, everyone was excited, and I, I felt like I had a front row seat to history, being here, man. At age nine, I was just so into this campaign and so excited by this future. Again, this sense that even though Dr. King was dead, there was somebody else that could pick up the mantle and keep going. And on January, on June 5th, as the California primary kind of picked up, it was too late for me to stay up and see what happened. So I went to bed that night excited again, thinking I had a front row seat to history. Um, but sadly, it was a different kind of history because the next morning my father woke me up and said that they had shot Bobby Kennedy the night before. But I tell you, man, even though Dr. King was dead and even though Bobby Kennedy had been murdered, I was alive. I had found that sense of what I wanted to be. I knew at that very early age I wanted to be part of this movement. I couldn't let those dreams die with those men. Now, years later, my pop, who was a Marine, we moved to Washington, D.C., and one of the first things we did, we went to Bobby Kennedy's grave. And there was a big throng around his very humble stone, but I was kind of turned around and looked, and there was on this wall a quote from a speech he made in Cape Town, South Africa, almost two years before he had been murdered. And it's the day of affirmation speech. And there's a line there that's etched on the wall that still sticks with me, man. It says, in effect, every time a person stands out and acts up against injustice, they send forth, they send forth a small ripple of hope. And from a million different energy sources of daring, those ripples can become waves that can wash down the mightiest walls of oppression. And that's when I dedicated myself to this idea of small, everyday movement, something I eventually came to um, in, uh, term as relentless incrementalism. This idea of just ne never stopping, never stopping. Someday big strides, someday small, but never stopping this idea of I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep moving forward. Badass movement all the time. Now, you have to understand, man, all I wanted to do, though, was open a nightclub. You know, I'm serious, man. No, as a kid, my parents argued just like everybody else. All their friends couldn't agree about politics. But, man, one night my father put on a Motown record, and all the people who didn't agree with Dr. King, Bobby Kennedy, everything, they danced. And as a young kid, I remember thinking that music, the lyrics are saying the exact same thing. Music has power. You know, most people are really brave when you get down to it. I mean, you know, people want to be brave, but they're just afraid. I'm going to fast forward a little bit, and you can't, probably can't say it, but years ago, I went and got a little teeny heart tattooed on my finger, a little small heart. So when I'm tempted to do this, I'm reminded, dude, reel it in. Don't be a hater. <laughs> reel it in, man. You know, most people are really cool. They're just afraid. Um, and so I ran nightclubs all over DC, man, and I booked bands all the way from the Bad Brains to Billy Eckstein, man, I had a great run. But then something crazy happened. Some friends of mine asked me to go out and feed the homeless one night. Now I should start every speech I give by saying, man, hey, my name is Robert and I'm a recovering hypocrite. Because I had spent my entire life dreaming of changing the world with music, but honestly, man, when somebody asked me to go out in my own backyard and serve people who are hungry, I looked for every excuse to get out of it. I was burdened by that fear, that sense of what would it be like I could deal with homeless people really, you know, from a distance and be empathetic, but that idea of up close. Well, long story short, I went out one night, and we ended up serving food purchased at one of the most expensive stores in D.C. to men and women who were standing outside in the rain. I pulled up in between George Washington University and the State Department and slid open this door, and there were a long line of people out there in the rain of Washington, D.C., like this, waiting for this truck to show up every night. And as I started serving people, 
the conversations began and my fears and my prejudice and my stereotypes started to wash away, but what I couldn't help but hear was the, di- the guy at the other end of the line, the driver of the truck who seemed to know everybody by name. And he was calling to them, see you tomorrow night, see you tomorrow night, see you tomorrow night, to each person as they went by. And it was as if that nine-year-old, that, that cusp of 10, that, that kid who dreamed of something, was tugging at my arm saying, dude, this is your moment. This is what you've been waiting for. You know, so well, I went home that night and I cooked up this idea that eventually became the DC Central Kitchen. And the idea was really pretty simple. Every single night, restaurants, hotels, hospitals, universities have food that's left over that they hate to throw away. If somebody could go and get that food, if you could get it and bring it back to a central hub, you could feed more people better food for less money. But more importantly, there had to be a way to shorten that line, to do something about that. That idea that what I had experienced that night was charity, which is in effect more about the redemption of the giver, not the liberation of the receiver. And that's what I wanted to flip around. So I decided, what would it be like if we could create a cooking school and offer men and women a chance to come in and out of the rain and be part of the solution? That in effect, they could work side by side and learn and get jobs in the same restaurants that donated the food. Now, it's funny, man, a lot of people at the time tried to shoot down the idea. In fact, to the point of saying, Robert, you're naive to think that restaurants are going to hire men and women who were former addicts. And I was like, dude, you have never worked in a restaurant. <laughs> man, you, you can't be too fucked up to get a job in a restaurant. You know, unless you are actively smoking crack while you're stirring the pot, you can work in a restaurant. But anyway, flash forward 25 years. And using this idea of side by side, men and women who were in a drug training program, side by side with some young kid who has to get service hours, standing next to an older person who really wants to stay engaged, standing next to the president of the United States or first family. And what's a more powerful way to demonstrate this idea of small acts and the notion that President Clinton, President Obama, two of the smartest men that ever were in the Oval Office, nonetheless, you put them in a big kitchen and say, we're gonna cook for 5,000 people today. They're gonna look to the person next to them. And again, imagine an addict, someone who might have been in prison for decades, Suddenly, in this wonderful, amazing moment, the president turns and says, am I doing this the right way? And that person can say, no, sir, you do it this way. That's power. That's the power of food. And it reveals the fact that everybody has a role. Everybody has something to contribute. Everybody has a gift. A great nonprofit doesn't try and fix the problem. It reveals the solutions that were there all along. And using this side-by-side method, over the past 25 years, we've been able to help 1,000 men and women go out and get great jobs and stay out of prison or off the street. And together, we produced over 30 million meals. Yeah, man, but one of my favorite writers, Hunter S. Thompson, once said, man, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. And I tell you, A, I am a pro at what I do. But the point is, the times are getting weird. And this is why I've come back to the city where I grew up. And that feeling of 1968, which is so important because every single morning in America, 10,000 people turn 68. Every single morning. And that's going to go on for the next 17, 18 years. It's oftentimes referred to as the silver tsunami. You know, this idea of this relentless wave of older people who sadly, many, will not have enough money in the bank for the extra 10 years that science is going to give them. And there's so many different ways that's going to test our mettle as a society. But none more profound is the notion of how are we going to feed those men and women. So I've come here to launch the LA Kitchen. And the idea is to take everything I learned in Washington, DC, but take it to a different level. Now, first and foremost, the goal is to go out to the Central Valley and Ventura. You know, I learned in DC that we, we throw away about 40% of the food we produce every single day in America. Half of that is fruits and vegetables. And the majority of reason those fruits and vegetables are wasted is because they aren't pretty. They're cosmetically imperfect. They're bent, they're bruised, they're broken, they have a wrinkle, they're underripe, they're overripe. For a thousand different reasons, they only get dissed under. So the idea of going out to get that food and to bring it back to this central kitchen we're building over in Northeast LA. And the goal there is to train younger men and women aging out of foster care who are statistically on the way out to the streets or to prison alongside men and women who are coming home after 10 or 20 years away. This intergenerational, this purposeful idea of generations coming together, learning with and from each other. Hopefully seeing older men and women looking to the younger men and women and saying, I'm not going to let you make the same mistakes I did. You know, I'm going to work with you and we're going to do this together. 
So this idea of generations together, using this, again, side-by-side -side model, so that, again, we can produce thousands of beautiful, healthy meals for older Angelinos. You know, this idea, too, of not just meals, but squeezing every ounce of opportunity after every piece of fruit or vegetable we get. So we're looking at juices. The idea of saying with uh, gerontologists at USC or UCLA, Alzheimer's is going to be a scourge. Man, let's, let's really look at fruits and vegetables now and see everything, every possible combination. Chop, dice, and mark my words, brothers and sisters, pureeing is the future. But that's another discussion. But there is a deeper hunger that I seek to feed. You know, I want to revert back to that silver tsunami. Because, you know, every single morning, I think about those baby boomers waking up. It's a wonder you can't hear a sigh every morning as you put your head out the window and realize 10,000 people are looking in the mirror and saying, man, how did I get so lost? You know, how could I have been part of a generation that heard with my own ears John Lennon, you know, Marvin Gaye, Barbara Jordan, Ma Bob Marley? You know, how, it's not too late. There's a sense, and you can see it coming, millions of people who want to be some, part of something bigger than themselves. You know, I see that silver tsunami as a manifestation of Robert Kennedy's idea of thousands of small ripples coming together. Because what you have is an opportunity not to hope that happens, but to go out and make it happen. You know, I'm building this kitchen to, to drag people, whether they like it or not, just as I was, into this experience where we can say, look, you can be part of something bigger. You can be part of not just LA, not just, a, not just America, but the entire world. Because think about it, globally, there's a billion people getting older who want to think before they die, I made something happen with my life. Now magnify that by the billions of young people in this world who, God bless them, don't want to choose between making money and getting a paycheck, don't want to choose between .com and .org. They want to blend everything to this idea where you're taking your spirituality, your lifestyle, and, and putting it together. For them and for many people, the idea of the future is philanthropy, is how you spend your money, how you make your money, your life. So what I'm building isn't just a fabulous kitchen, brothers and sisters. It's a metaphorical surfboard because there's a wave coming and I want to ride it. And I want to invite a lot of other people to be out there with me, man. And can you imagine a better city and a better time? There's an old saying, man, Los Angeles is where the future comes to happen. That's why I'm here, man. I'm here to catch a big, fat wave and ride it with all my heart. Cowabunga, motherfuckers. <laughs>